This is, uh, oh, just a chance to get the sound right. This is an odd week. The, the week is filled with so many different things. We have New Year's. We have uh, still Christmas season. And so we got some Christmas songs we're going to sing. It's almost Epiphany. Epiphany's Thursday. And uh, so we're going to uh, touch base a little bit with the wise men. And uh, it just, there's just so many things. It's like the poor pastor goes, what am I supposed to talk about? I can't put it all in one sermon, you know. So we're going to talk about Jesus in the temple today and some of the things connected with that because he grows up really fast. He's going to be 12 years old this morning in our gospel lesson. It seems like we just had him in a manger. And we did. But that's the way it goes uh, because uh, we moved on our story of our salvation. We moved through pretty quickly. So that's interesting, though. So we'll talk about some of the things you might not have noticed about it before. So God bless us as we do that. Um, why don't we begin that? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless our worship time this morning. Why don't we stand for our opening song? <laughs>
<laughs> Happy New Year, everybody. With our uh, time of confession as we do each week. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We gather here as our Christmas celebration continues, fully aware how quickly time flies. There's much more to the story of the gospel than the nativity, beginning with the reason for it, our inability to earn our salvation by our own efforts. Yet we are also reminded that we are bidden to confess our sins to God in the confidence that he has first chosen and loved us and gives us his forgiveness for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Take a moment of silence to reflect on what a blessing that is in our lives. And we join together, Almighty God, we stand on the threshold of another year. We thank you for bringing us to another plateau of life. You have given us many gifts during the last year, and yet we realize how often we have failed to use them as you desired, squandering opportunities, letting our doubts overwhelm us, and allowing our sins to bind us and our fears to hold us back. Give us a new beginning. May this year be filled with wrongs corrected, friendships deepened, and the disheartened encouraged. We have been touched by the joy of Christmas. Help us to carry that joy into the new year with a new attitude and boldness to share your love and good news with others. God is good and gracious. He hears our heartfelt prayers and answers us according to his perfect will. We don't face this new year alone, but with our loving Heavenly Father at our side. By your faith in Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer, all your sins have been forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, go ahead and take a seat for our next song.
second Sunday after Christmas reading comes from Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 4 through 15. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, I have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall ri arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and beheld, behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem, and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading comes from Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven and things on earth in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first hope to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. The lyrics on this next one are going to look really familiar if you're paying good attention to the last verses.
please rise for a gospel reading? The Holy Gospel this morning comes to us from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2, beginning at verse 40. And the child Jesus grew and became strong and filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when Jesus was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, and then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. That must have taken a lot of restraint from Mary. I'm just saying, I got a 12-year-old, and she, she had that much patience to just treasure those things and ponder them in her heart. It was definitely a miracle.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever wondered why holiday time seems to fly by at a faster pace than regular time? You know, one day you're eating pumpkin pie, and then you're eating a Christmas cookie, and before you know it, you're stocking up on those little cans of Vienna sausages you stick a toothpick to and roast over a can of Sterno to celebrate the new year, or however you do it. Feels like you're living in a Roadrunner cartoon from one end to the other, doesn't it, sometimes? Psychologists say it has something to do with our perception of time, the built-up emotional anticipation before the holiday and the psychological pressure during one, uh, just to make sure that it's you know, nothing less than magical. It's called the holiday paradox. When we're in the moment with a limited amount of time to pack in as much as we can or all we, we really have to do to make the magic happen, uh, we end up wondering where all the time went. In the midst of the planning, the cleaning, the shopping, the cooking, the baking, the visits to relatives, not just on one side, but maybe both sides, and the, the holiday parties and more, time gets sort of condensed. Uh, if you're a fan of the Matrix movies, it's, uh, they call it bullet time. But afterward, in retrospect, looking back to all our newly formed memories, it can seem like we must have had much more time than we actually did. One researcher calls it the time machine of our mind. You know, where we are in time affects how we view the speed of time. It's, reasoning, uh, it's the reasoning behind what's called the Christmas creep. Uh, retailers displaying their, their holiday uh, items months in advance, right? It creates a perception among consumers that the holiday is, is uh, passing by much more quickly uh, than it actually is, that it's slipping away even before it gets here way before. And so we can't help ourselves. We go out and we begin to shop till we drop. There's no psychological for the, uh, no psychological name for how fast Jesus seems to grow up in the Gospels, though. Nine days ago, we were celebrating his birth. Eight days ago, Mary and Joseph were presenting him in the temple in accordance with the law. That would have made him 40 days old already. And this morning, he's already 12, just a year away from the Jewish age of accountability. We want to know more, so let's see if we can catch you up a little. After his consecration in the temple, Luke says that his family returned to Nazareth, and they did, eventually. But a lot happened in between the manger and Luke and their return to Nazareth. There's the danger that Matthew fills us in on. That's where the wise men come in. They followed the star to Jerusalem, where they inquired of King Herod where this newborn king might be found. He consults his own wise guys who pour through the scriptures and the prophecies, and they come up with Bethlehem. Once he finds out the exact time the miraculous star they were following appeared, he asks them to return with more details so that he can go worship them also. You know, wink, wink, Herod was ruthless. Uh, he, he really didn't see Jesus as a savior at all, but rather as a threat to his throne, and he planned to eliminate him. He was so brutal, he'd already killed several members of his own family, he saw as threats. Matthew says the star led the wise men right to the house where Jesus and his family lived. A house, not a stable anymore. You know, it was there that they worshipped him and presented their gifts. So after Jesus' presentation in the temple, the holy family had evidently returned to Bethlehem and began to put down roots. We don't know for sure, really, how long they'd been there. The wise men were warned in a dream not to return to Herod in Jerusalem, um, and so they took a different route home. And Jesus' Father in heaven was protecting him. So as soon as the Magi left, Joseph is warned in a dream to take his little family to Egypt because Herod was going to search for Jesus so he could kill him. Now Bethlehem was only about a two-hour journey from Jerusalem, so there was really no time to lose. In fact, the wise men may have spoken to Joseph and Mary the same day they'd spoken to Herod. So 
it's even possible that they, that they left for their home that same night, the night Joseph had his dream. Now, if that's the case, Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus could have been gone by the next morning, simply disappeared as far as all the villagers would have known, uh, without a trace. No one in Bethlehem could tell Herod's soldiers where they were because no one knew. Matthew says they left during the night. Now, we don't know how long the Bethlehem years lasted, but we can surmise it was no more than uh, two, probably, because in his anger at being outwitted by everyone, Herod ordered the death of all baby boys in the region who were two years old and younger, just in an attempt to somehow get to Jesus. But again, Jesus, our rescuer, has been rescued by his heavenly father. It wouldn't be until after this particular Herod died that Joseph was told by an angel in another dream that it was time to go back to Israel. Because Herod's son Archelaus was ruling in place of his father, another bad king, Joseph took his family back to their original hometown in Nazareth, beyond the new king's jurisdiction, thus fulfilling prophecies that Jesus would be a Nazarene. Now, Nazareth was so uh, anonymous, it was a good place to disappear during the vulnerable years of his youth. Other than the Bible, it won't even be mentioned until sometime in the seventh century, when a poem written by a single Jewish author names it as one of the places refugees fled to after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And that's the first time outside of scripture um, that its existence was even confirmed. Would have been a great place for the Lord to grow up anonymously. And grow he did. Although none of the gospel writers have given us any details about these years until our lesson this morning when Jesus is on the cusp of Hebrew manhood. The lack of facts didn't stop second and early third century writers from putting on their thinking caps and recording what might have happened though. By the time Jesus was famous worldwide and Christianity had become a movement, the demand for stories about his early life was growing. All those empty hidden years people wanted to know more about created a ready audience unscrupulous writers were only too eager to step up and satisfy. They often blended their fiction with verses pulled straight from the gospels to make it sound more authentic. They attached names of famous people to their work in order to get it read. Now, fortunately, those imaginative efforts were never really accepted by the church at large as factual. In fact, they were rejected as heresy and so subsequently never made it into the Bible. Some read more like fairy tales than the truth, and it, it helps to hear a couple of the phonies to, to appreciate the facts. A lot of them come from what are known as the infancy narratives or the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, the apostle who didn't actually write it, nor was he alive when they were written. Uh, these writings spread, and they were even read among certain uh, factions of the blossoming church that embraced them, though, uh, most of which would themselves be eventually declared heterodox or, or uh, heretical. Now, we know that Jesus' first recorded miracle was changing water into wine at a wedding in Cana. But in the infancy narratives, uh, there's a story about another miracle. It's in the opening verses of chapter 1. It says, Jesus, while still in his cradle, said to his mother, Mary, I am Jesus, the Son of God, that word which you did bring forth according to the declaration of Gabriel to you. And my Father has sent me for the salvation of the world. Well, that would be creepy, right? An adult-talking baby. Uh, Jesus was true God and true man, right? But in order to fulfill the law for us, he had to set aside his divine abilities and live as one of us, until the time of his ministry. Miraculously speaking as an infant wouldn't fill that bill. And besides, Joseph and Mary already knew all about who he was. They'd gotten it straight from the angel Gabriel when Mary at first became pregnant. So there are a lot, of, lot more stories like this, though, going all the way back to the Egypt years, and even uh, they follow him to Nazareth, with Jesus growing up as a young child, making animals out of clay and then bringing them to life. Some of his antics getting him condemned by by the neighbor kid's parents as a sorcerer. Uh, amazing stuff. But knowing the facts as we do from the gospel, the truth of Jesus growing up without any miracles may have been even more amazing than the tall tales. All Luke says about his Nazareth time is that as the child grew, he increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Those are the facts. Now there was a godlike quality about him from the beginning. He'd come to live as one of us but in, in every way uh, without sin. In real life, he would have received the same education as all the other young Jewish boys of his age during that time. A regular course of religious studies described in the Talmud. 
He would have been exposed to the Mishnah, the tradition of the elders, the, what came to be known as the oral law that uh, was given to Moses on Sinai. He would have known the scriptures. He would have known the, his people's history. He would have known the prophecies. So it was with an eager heart that Jesus set out with the pilgrims making their way to the Passover celebration in Jerusalem. But at the same time, we have to wonder what this 12-year-old boy must have been feeling as, he, as he, they passed maybe through the city gates, this great city, the place where Abraham had visited thousands of years before, before it even was a big city, the place where David had reigned, the city that murdered the prophets and would one day crucify him. Crowning Mount Moriah and dominating everything was the temple. And we can imagine his eyes constantly drawn to it. He called it my father's house, although it was in fact being expanded and remodeled by the Herods. It sounds like it was a custom for Joseph and Mary to attend the Passover feast um, in Jerusalem each year and to do it together. Really only, only men were required to go. Uh, but it was a major event. It, was, it drew like rose parade kinds of crowds. In the spirit of the celebration and for safety, they would have gone with other people, a large group of neighbors, friends, uh, and relatives probably. They went together and they returned together. Now, not in long, you know, straight line, military style parade kind of thing, but in various groups that would get maybe a little strung out during the day and uh, as part of a, a large caravan and then meet up to spend the night together. Uh, times were maybe different then. But the feast celebrated the greatest redemptive event to history, uh, in the history of Israel, the time God delivered the Israelites from bondage in Egypt. After keeping the feast, Joseph and Mary got packed up and left for home, minus Jesus. They traveled the whole day thinking with, he must have been with some of the others in their group. When everyone reunited at the end of the day, though, they realized Jesus wasn't with their group. And as frantic as we get when our kids get lost at Target for 15 seconds, Imagine losing God's son. I mean, there aren't words to describe what they must have felt. They'd take a head count, they'd do a roll call, only to confirm their worst fears. Somehow, they'd managed to leave God behind. And so back they go, scouring the countryside, hoping for scraps of information on their way. They return to their old lodgings in Jerusalem, probably search the marketplaces, the bazaars, not once thinking about the temple, which really was the obvious place to look if they would only slow down and, and think it through for a moment. Well, finally, they went there too, and of course, there he was, sitting amid the teachers, listening and asking them questions, astounding everyone present with his understanding and his answers to their questions. He wasn't intimidated. He knew why, who he was and why he was there. Nor, being without sin, would he have been forward or impolite. He simply amazed them. Now, Joseph and Mary were equally astonished. Now, we don't have any reference in our lives really for comparison. We have prodigies, and Jesus was certainly a prodigy by, by our human standards or in human terms, but he was so much more because he was perfect, and as perfect as Adam had been before the fall. His thinking, his processing, his actions uh, were untainted by a fallen nature. Now, Mary and Joseph knew that, and it's hard to believe they could have forgotten, but maybe they you know, gotten so used to his being gifted and so good that they'd begun to just sort of take it for granted. His brilliance and behavior were just a way of life for them. So commonplace, they'd maybe forgotten why. Forgotten that his deity was clothed with perfect humanity. Now Mary speaks first. She's disappointed at what she considered to be thoughtless behavior. Left on edge by her fears and the nightmares she'd just been through. Son, why have you treated us so? Your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And Jesus answers with a correction. Now, some people have suggested um, the reason that we have no word of Jesus again from this moment until his ministry begins uh, 18 years later is because after this stunt, uh, he was grounded for that long. <laughs> but we don't know for sure. But it was no stunt, and, and he wasn't grounded. Um, this was no adolescent rebellion. It was just a truth. A truth that, that really has to be addressed so there's no misunderstanding. He says, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Think of all he's saying there. First of all, he's saying that Joseph is not his biological father. Of course, Joseph wasn't. Uh, Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Uh, he was fully aware of exactly who he really was. And so they should have already known exactly where to come looking for him. 
in his father's house being about his father's business. Now, his, that business wasn't about the work of carpentry. It's about the work of the cross. But even Jesus' parents didn't understand everything he was saying. It would be the beginning of a theme that would follow Jesus through his whole ministry. Uh, his parents wouldn't understand. His brothers and sisters wouldn't un really understand. Even his closest friends and his disciples wouldn't fully understand until after his resurrection, until after his post-resurrection appearances, like the one on the road to Emmaus where he appeared to, to some of his followers and then uh, opened their eyes to the scriptures about him. We can ask ourselves how they could have missed it, but then we look back on it as history for us, a different point of view. So we don't want to be too hard on his parents, probably. Sometimes it's hardest to see what's right in front of you, right? We've all done it. Luke says that Jesus returned home with his parents and was the obedient son. And then he adds that Mary treasured all these things up, filed them in a way in her heart for the day it would all become clear. And Luke leaves it just like that. And so the real story is even amazing that all the fiction that would be written about him over 100 years uh, or more later. In fact, this story about losing God tells us more about God and ourselves than we could ever have imagined. Losing God would be a real tragedy, but today's lessons are about real wisdom. Now, this is the time of year, isn't it? The beginning of a new year. It's the time of year we traditionally stop and evaluate our lives. You know, do we have everything we need moving forward? Are there some things we should leave behind? One thing you don't want to lose track of on your journey forward is God. His presence in your life can make all the difference between success and failure in the coming year. Uh, and he promises that if you let him, you know, he'll go with you. Winning and, and losing take on a whole different meaning when you examine life from God's point of view. He sees the big picture, right? The really big picture, past, present, and future, all of it. So be wise, grow in wisdom. We read about Jesus. Take some regular Nazareth time to stop and to listen and grow. I'm pretty sure he'll have lots to say. Amen. Now may that very special peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll take a moment now to receive your gifts, your tithes, and your offerings.
take a moment now to confess our Christian faith together. We'll do it this morning in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please stand as we confess our faith with one another. Please join with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting Amen. Let us pray now for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Holy Father, as your Son was once found in the arms of the Virgin Mary, so now is he found in your Holy Christian Church. Cause your word to abide richly among us, that many would be led to Christ through our witness. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, your Son diligently heard the word of God and grew in wisdom and stature, submissive to his earthly parents and always, always about your business and in your house. Keep the families of your church abiding in your word, eager to be found among your word and sacraments and always treasuring your divine wisdom and favor. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, uphold and strengthen our nation's leaders and all public servants. Give them the wisdom to lead according to your guidance. Keep safe those who are tasked with protecting its citizens. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, give patience and endurance to all who are sick or in any need this day. Restore them to health and heal them according to your will. Receive our thanksgiving for every blessing and kindness you have shown to your people in Christ. Give comfort and hope to all who mourn. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, your Son has won redemption through his blood, granting the forgiveness of our trespasses. According to the riches of your grace, soften hardened hearts and turn many to your call to repentance. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, in mercy you have established the Christian home among us. We implore you, rule and direct our hearts to be good examples to children and those subject to us, that we may not offend them by word or deed, but faithfully teach them to love your church and hear your blessed word. Give them your spirit and grace that the seed may bring forth good fruit and our home life may advance your glory, your honor, and your praise. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the same Holy Spirit, one God now and forever, and who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his very, very, very special peace. Amen. You know this one. Sing it out nice and loud with us as a closer. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born.
bless your week. Can't wait to see you next week.